is that if you do the math on that report, it looks a lot like there was a lot more than 1.3 billion uh, because they actually show, uh, if you noticed, I'm trying to open this right now, but uh, they show the allocation to GBTC, the ARC, Fidelity, and, and the like, right? And I think if you had those up, it's a bit more than 1.3. It's more like 1.6 or something. Did you uh, notice well, that? I haven't, I haven't actually seen the, um, the, the filing yet. I just saw the news uh, just a bit ago. Um, and so I haven't actually had to see the filing yet. Yeah. But, uh, well, so this is what it, this is what it, it says, a 13F SEC filing by, sec, sec, I can never say their name correctly, Grayscale BTC is $1 billion, So their largest holding is in Grayscale. Interesting. <laughs> Fidelity Bitcoin, $83.7 million. BlackRock Bitcoin, $23.6 million. Arc twenty one five hundred and thirty six million half a billion dollars in the Arc twenty one fund. Bitwise twenty one point seven million. Valkyrie three point eight million. Invesco eleven million. Vanek Bitcoin twenty million. And Wisdom Tree twenty million. I mean, oh, wow. That, wow. yeah, exactly. Dude. That, I mean, that's one point seven billion right there. So, that's but, crazy. But anyway. They're spreading it across a bunch of different uh, ETFs, which I think is interesting. Um, and it surprised me they put so much in the GBTC because of the complaint on the fees. Yeah, yeah. There's, um, there's some going on there. That's, that's a lot. I, I'm really surprised um, that they've got that in there. Um, but I wonder... I'll stick it in the nest. Well, well I wonder, is, is it... Uh, see now we got to look back at that. I wonder if maybe it's something they were holding um, previous to the to to the conversion to the ETF back when GBTC was the only way to get into that type of thing, kind of. Yeah, I suspect it's been in the last quarter. That's that's gonna be a thing. Right. Yeah, yeah, no. I mean that's. Um, nonetheless, huge, huge. It's it's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, now, now, you know, you and I talk a lot about narratives. Where does this, like, no longer become part of the narrative? It actually is data, facts, although in, in, uh, the chart may not react to it or predict it, but we're, you know what I'm saying? Where does this become, hey, this is real data now. We have a monster player, one of the biggest players in the world, talking about $1.4 billion in investments in these ETFs. The first quarter, you know there's going to be more of this. And the game theory this creates, this is not just a narrative kind of story. It's happening. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, again, um, once, uh, you know, once these guys are doing this and, and, and you know, um, especially when it comes in terms of, uh, you know, th this is really big with the RIAs. You know, again, if, if you're if you're sitting there and your RIA, your RIA is saying, you know, listen, um you can't, you know, get into the Bitcoin ETF here, but you know the competing the competing RIA over there saying, you know, hey guys, come on over here, we can do this. You know that that ends up putting a lot of pressure uh, because they're not gonna they're not really gonna be different on fees and whatnot, right? So how do you differentiate yourself? And you do it, you know, by offering, um, you know, uh, other products, right? So you know we're gonna see that with the RIAs, um, but I think they're. To an extent, also, the, these larger players um, that are holding Bitcoin ETFs, uh, I think that's going to even cause some, okay, well, you know, so-and-so's got it, and they're kind of really serious about this. Maybe we need to get serious about it, too, because then you're going to start looking at returns, right? Um, what what kind of returns are these companies getting? And, you know, as all the research has shown, uh, even just having like a 5% allocation, 3% uh, allocation with Bitcoin, you know, um, increases significantly uh your return you know and, and so I, I think you know we're going to see that to an extent um e even just among uh firms and whatnot that are holding the bitcoin etfs where again we start you know through these um these 13f filings we start seeing who's got what uh you know your competitors uh, unless unless you're just stubbornly like you know i hate bitcoin <laughs> uh you know i was talking to um 
to some people the other day about Warren Buffett. Man, Berkshire Hathaway's got something like 190. I think he's got like 190 billion, closing in on 200 billion in free cash. Where does he put that? I mean, you know, uh, Elon was like, "Hey, put it in Tesla." But I mean, if you're putting it in Tesla, that's kind of a Bitcoin play, right? Uh, it holds some Bitcoin there, uh, and we all know how you know Warren Buffett feels about Bitcoin. So, you know, does he now not put all that money he's got? Does he not put any of it into Tesla or MicroStrategy or, or you know, any of these companies that are really starting to get uh, Bitcoin and just because they're holding Bitcoin, or does he? You know, does he give in and then do it? I, I think it. I think which things are just really starting to get interesting right now. If you're in market, I think this is really exciting at this point now. Chris, I couldn't. I couldn't agree any more with you. It's staggering, um, and that you brought up the great Warren. Uh, I was talking to. Uh, I was on an interview today, and I, I remembered 1995. I could have bought Berkshire Hathaway A series. At eight thousand dollars, and I listen to all these young young uh, investor traders in this space, and I'm like, you know, I, I passed up the opportunity by eight thousand uh, dollar Warren, you, you know, Warren, and uh, today it's worth six hundred and eleven thousand dollars, <laughs> right? And I, I literally thought I would get smart and go buy something for eighty dollars instead of eight thousand. I still can't remember uh, those stocks that I you know, played for the discount, yeah. they're still not in my portfolio. I made no money and I passed on a, what is that, dude? 80,000 since 1995 yeah. to 611,000 is what, an 80Xer? Yeah, yeah. This could absolutely happen for Bitcoin, okay? Like I, everybody's talking about, well, the returns on Bitcoin are going to be less than the token market. I'm like, what the F are y'all talking about? What? Like I... No, no, I, I think the most interesting thing about that is, you know, when I first uh, got in here back in 2017 in January, um, you know, and, and I was looking at this uh, and we're looking, OK, what's the potential here? Um, you know, Bitcoin really is, you know, a, a tech, a tech, uh, a technology. Right. And so, you know, technologies often have these um, these adoption curves, these S curves. And so, you know, this is where I kind of get into this point here and I go, well, with everything happening, rather than this being some major top here, do we get that that big, huge push upward um, as, as we go through the mid part of that S-curve? You know, that's, that, that's the big um, um, the big acceptance, mainstream acceptance, uh, where, where you really get a lot in there. And, and, and I mean, so, you know, I, I can't obviously... I, I don't know that we do or we don't, but man, oh man, the, the potential, if, if that is, if, if that's what we're starting into right now and that is what's happening, I mean, it just it just doesn't make sense um, to sit here and ignore Bitcoin. I mean, I get people want to come in and they want to try and get rich quick and overnight and, you know, it, people are going to give a lot of excuses of why, oh no, I'm not doing that, you know, is what they'll say, but the reality of it is that people do. Uh, again, you know, the thing I noticed was, You've got the same type of um, degenerate trading going on in crypto that we had, you know, in Forex uh, prior to crypto because of the leverage and everything else. Everybody trying to get rich overnight, man. But just I, I just act, man, I don't know. At, at my age now and my experience, you know, when I first came in, I probably, you know, I might have looked at Bitcoin that way and go, oh, well, you know, I can't make a, you know, I can't get rich enough quick enough with it. But damn, man, now. Now, with my experience and my age and, and doing this for so long, it's it's like the silliest thought. It's the silliest thought because then you're going to miss out on what the potential is for Bitcoin there if you're looking at that price um, as, as what your kind of goal is. Chris, can you and maybe even Gary speak to what does it look like when so many large institutions are in on this that it's actually just hard to get a hold of Bitcoin? I mean, how likely of a scenario is that if I'm already seeing reporting that exchanges are hitting all-time lows uh, and we're just now breaking into some of this in institutional money getting in now? Like, what does that look like? Can you even predict or chart that out? Well, I think, you know, the first thing to understand is there are sellers at all prices. There's always sellers. You've got four sellers. You've got willing sellers, right? Um you know, for sellers, they have to sell, uh, you know, miners, even if they can get loans and whatnot, they still have to sell at some point to uh, to pay those back. 
uh, for their operating costs because it's very expensive, obviously, to mine. Um, you've got your Joe Blow down the street who maybe comes into a divorce uh, and, you know, has to sell uh, to settle, you know, what he's got to pay in the divorce. And, and maybe he's, you know, uh, got a lot of money. Um, and then you've got willing sellers. You know, there's always willing sellers at all prices, right? I may not sell at 70000 but, um, you know, Jim down the road might be, you know, itching to do so even at 68. So you've got that. The other thing, though, is that um, the I, I think today, especially with um, with these bigger players coming in, I think the um, the Bitcoin hell on exchanges is not something that we really should be paying a whole lot of attention to, because if you think about it, these these ETFs and whatnot, um, you know, and all these bigger players they're not going to hold their, um, you know, they can't just hold it on the exchange, right? They've got fiduciary duties, blah, blah, blah. They've got to have custody um, happening. That happens off the exchange. So um, I, I wouldn't rely a whole bunch on the the low number of Bitcoin on the exchange uh, because a lot of that is probably due to concentration by bigger players who have to hold it, uh, who have to custody it, you know, off those exchanges. Yeah, because I just, I think, okay, if I'm BlackRock, and I view this as a valuable asset. And I'm also invested in a lot of these Bitcoin miners who I know have to sell. Do I even just go directly to the Bitcoin miners and get the, the Bitcoin before it even goes on exchange? And just start doing that to really maximize the amount of Bitcoin I can get before anybody else? Well, if you talk about BlackRock as, as the ETF, I mean, you know... They, they don't just go out there and blindly buy, you know, they buy and sell according to the demand for their, uh, their ETF and, you know, how much, however much they have to buy or sell to, um, you know, to, to, to keep that price, um, you know, as, as far as who's coming in and, and who's leaving. So, I mean, you know, big BlackRock on itself, holding it, you know, itself, that would maybe be something, but yeah, as far as like ETFs go, uh, you know, they, they just buy and sell accordingly at the end of the day. Uh, after market hours, um, legacy market hours, uh, in accordance with, you know, whatever their net outflow or inflow was in terms of their shares. Got it. So really, overall message here is Bitcoin on exchanges hitting all time lows like that. That doesn't really matter. I don't I, I really don't think so. I don't think like it used to, because before when we used to watch it, you know, a few years back, it was before, you know, micro strategy was basically the big one in there. Tesla had some, but, you know. Uh, basically, it was all the rest of us. Um, and now, with the Bitcoin ETFs, um, and then you see Susquehanna, uh, Susquehanna there, uh, and and um, Hightower Advisors, and all these kind of coming in. Uh, you know, again, they, they can't just keep it on the exchange. They got to keep it, you know, custodied. And so that's going to take those um, Bitcoin off the exchanges. Uh, but you know, again, um, there's you know there's forced buyer there's willing buyers and there's the the forced or I mean willing sellers and forced sellers, and so you're going to have both of them you know as price rises and as price falls um, along the way. So yeah, I don't think um, I personally don't watch it anymore just because of that reasoning there. Gotcha. Well, I know we got some other speakers up here, but Chris, do you have anything you want to talk about before I even call on anybody or Gary? Is there anything you kind of want to highlight? Um. Uh yeah, uh, you know what I would love, Chris? I, I sent you a um, chart of Berkshire Hathaway preferred A. Uh, I would love you to look at that chart and tell me what you see there and if there's any correlation in your mind of the potential for Bitcoin to replicate this. Everyone keeps talking about Bitcoins, you know, maxed out. And I look at some of these other companies like this company, NVIDIA, and others, and it seems to me like the great performers of the past um, have actually told us exactly what Bitcoin should do, if not greater. Now, maybe I'm just reading into the tea leaves because I'm so long at this point, but I did find this uh, chart really interesting on Berkshire. Love your input on it. Uh, let me see here. I kind of look here. Um, and, and so what exactly is your question again? <clears throat> well, just when I look at it, that goes back to 1996. Okay. It was $8,000. Um, I passed on this. Okay. I passed on this because 
at the time I was a young man and I was like, oh, eight thousand dollars. I can't buy one share. OK, this this is my point. I'm trying to like I have made this mistake so many times. I cannot imagine this probably I would have probably been able to buy 10 shares of this at that age uh, at eight thousand dollars. I didn't do it. Instead, I bought an $8 stock or an $80 stock, and I still can't remember the name of those because they probably all flamed out. Now it's worth 76 times that, Yeah. right? And here's a company that has very little technology. Oh, by the way, Mr. Diversity, 42% that makes up the holdings of this performance is Apple. <laughs> okay, this guy's a... Con concentrated investor like massively concentrated yeah. right so i just think it's a very interesting chart for younger investors especially the guys chasing the alpha um being convinced they can turn that you know meme coin into 10x and i look at this and go gosh why am i having to chase 10x here's 76 yeah yeah no um you know, and, and that's exactly uh, the point I think we need to really kind of focus on and make is that, you know, again, a lot of the guys coming in here, maybe listening in are of that type who are trying to make that quick money. But like you mentioned, you know, I, we've all got things like that. We've all got if we've ever been in the market for any amount of time, we've all passed up on some great, uh, you know, options looking for the faster, you know, quicker return when we're younger but that, you know, man, it, it's so hard to explain that to somebody who hasn't been through it. Um, you know, it's, it's, I think it's one of those, those real life lessons um, that, that you kind of, that you, that you just go through. I mean, I can sit here, you can sit here and talk to her blue in the face, um, talk about missed opportunities uh, because we were doing the same thing. But most people that are listening, honestly, are not going to give it a whole lot of, uh, you know, a whole lot of thought. You know, they're still stuck in the, I want to get, you know, as rich as possible, as quick as possible. Uh, they want the shortcut. They want the dopamine hit um, that comes with those those quick trades and, um, you know, lower cap, big pops and stuff like that. And, you know, you kind of got to go through that and learn that, oh, my gosh, most likely that isn't going to, you know, isn't going to happen for me. Yeah, I hear you, man. I hear you. Okay. Um, anything else on the market as far as you see any particular chop? Uh, in the short term or anything that uh, you're looking for breakouts and then we'll just kind of maybe open it up to the audience unless uh, Sam's got uh, some political stuff. Yeah, I'm just uh, Bitcoin right now. You know, we're just kind of ranging. We've been ranging locally since uh, I guess about three days now. Um, I'm, I'm looking for potentially to drop on down to around 60, uh, 61, 7, 62,000 maybe. If we can get a reversal off there, I think we're good to go for a breakout to a new all-time high. Um, I mean, so far, the, the whole structure looks really good. I just want to see that that uh, that little bit more pullback here if we can get it. And then that breakout uh, above the, the local swing high here at around 65.5 or so. If we can do that again, I think it really sets up for a strong likelihood that we see the... Um, uh, yeah, a new all-time high coming in. I did post a chart. If anybody's following me, TX West Capital, um, I did post a chart, an AVAX chart, that I think looks absolutely amazing. Um, it looks like it's been an accumulation for almost 1,200 days, uh, and we're up toward the top there. I think we'll probably get it's, – it's a weekly time frame chart, uh, but I think we're probably closer to a breakout, a new all-time high um, than not at this time. But uh, I think it's, it's probably – a pretty good area to enter as long as your stop loss is correct um, for, for that, for that potential breakout and head out. I mean, it looks like it's getting ready to, to finish up that accumulation. So yeah, I like that. <laughs> well, that's awesome. Um, are you a big AVAX guy, Chris? One question just before I, I move to, I know Wolf web threes had his hand up and then my boy Kelly is up here. I see Fibaswamy. I'll be calling on you guys here soon, but um, you big AVAX guy at all, Chris? Um, I, I am not a big anything other than Bitcoin guy, to be honest. Um, you know. Okay, the, so you're just looking at the chart and just going, "Ooh, that's a good opportunity." Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, you know, most of these most of these um, alts are going to go to zero at some point, um, and so I'm not interested. I'm not like, "Oh, I'm going to invest in this for years to come." Um, I'm all about the chart itself. 
I'll take the uh, the money while I can. Uh, Bitcoin is the one that I'm actually looking at as far as you know something that's going to stick around. So um, you know that, that that hurts a lot of feelings <laughs> uh, because people tend to get really emotionally tied uh, to to you know to the bags of whatever they're holding. Um, but I just you know I, I've, I've been we've been going through this me myself since January 2017 with the ICOs back then, and we just see it. Um, cycle after cycle where, you know, you've got some new narrative, everything's great. Uh, bear cycle comes in and they're all pretty much ruined and new cycle starts next time around. So, yeah, if they're offended, you know, they can just deal with it. They are all adults here. I think we all get the gist. Chris, do you, do you see the, uh, dominance? Oh, sorry. This is my 007 Gary Cardone clone, but do you see the dominance on Bitcoin continuing to expand? Uh, or, yeah. or do you even bother to look at it? No, no, no. We actually keep up with it um, at the Trading Academy. We do we do it weekly. Um, but yeah, no, I've got it going up higher. I've got it um, heading up above 60, uh, 60%. So um, yeah, no, I, right now I, I believe we'll probably see it continue up higher here. Yeah, I think a lot of people are struggling with those kind of 60 type. I, I think you could go above 60, you know, three okay. years, right? <laughs> okay, sorry to, sorry to keep uh, side ra railing you there, Samuel. <laughs> no, that's good. And hey, guys, remember, if you're in the space, make sure you're retweeting or commenting, especially if you're a speaker. If you're a speaker up here, we want people to come and hear you. So make sure as a speaker, you're retweeting and liking the space as well. WolfWeb3, you've had your hand up for a while. I've heard a lot of your spaces. I'm super excited that you're here today. Thanks for coming on, man. What do you got to tell us? What's the alpha? Man, it's orange pill. The alpha is orange pill, dude. No, I, you know, I, I think um, a lot of times I've, I've been, uh, like originally when I got into crypto, you know, you kind of lean towards, especially being younger, you lean towards innovation and not institutional. Like the young kids like innovation, but the like older crowd likes iteration, you know, they like, like, like something tried and true and it's like iterate on the process and the young kids are looking for new places to put their money. Like you even see this with like on top of Bitcoin, you have ordinals, runes, and if you go into like kind of what's um, under the hood a little bit, they're like hiding code inside the op return in the transactions for Bitcoin. And so they're like sneakily adding protocols inside of something that was never really meant for it, but they're figuring out ways to do it. Same with Sailor, you know, Sailor just popped out with the identity protocol. That's going to be pretty much the same thing that Ordinals is doing where you're hiding, you know, code inside of uh, like transactions on the Bitcoin chain. So you're getting the ability to kind of, you know, sneakily like add, add pieces to the equation so no <coughs> one thing i will young people by the way what who are you referring to what age bracket are young people so I, i'd say you know as soon as you start like um understanding finance and consuming social media i think that that's really the bracket because 12 year olds and 13 year olds consume social media but they don't understand finance yet and they also don't have disposable money to throw around so i think 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, where you're, you know, you're really consuming social media in a, in a pretty like heavy fashion. And now you're starting to have disposable income. You're seeing like those people are really looking for innovation and looking for like new protocols and new ideas to throw money into one, because zero to one makes more money than two to five, just because, you know, the nature of the beast, as more money goes into the market cap, the X's become less. Uh, you know, this is obvious, but, um, and, and I think that the, the risk tolerance for a younger generation is like, <laughs> it's way higher than the older generation, um, just because they don't have very much to lose. You know, when you're super young and you live at your parents' house or you're a college kid, you throw in a hundred bucks here, 500 bucks here, you know, 2000, 3000 doesn't really mean quite as much as somebody who's really, and I say this with a, with a grain of salt, but you know, really worked for their money and is not going to put it into an erroneous place. That's just going to lose out. So. Um, you, you're, is your case that they don't even matter? Because that's what, what do you I, mean? Well, they're, they're insignificant. The, the five hundred one, they will lose all of that money. It all goes. You know, we talk about hey, the traders. You know, one or two percent. That means ninety eight people out of a hundred fail at this game. Ninety eight out of one hundred. But that is a horrific. If you told me, hey, look, let's. Gary, I, I, I've got a strategy for you to deploy a million dollars. And 98 out of 100 people go bust doing this. Yeah. Uh, if they're only bringing $500 to the table, they're going to get washed out, right? Mm, yep. So if they don't care anyway, and it's their, 
their mommy's money and like I just don't see how they even make any relevance to whether or not Bitcoin is successful or not. Now, yes. I think that, that they, they become that user later, right? But they don't have any money, well, dude. Well, I think there's a couple things. So, like, let's look at the Stacks ecosystem. So, Stacks is building on top of BTC. So, I don't think that there's going to be, like, zero use cases for innovation with Bitcoin. Bitcoin's going to be, like, the tried and true. And, like, I think the greater point for me here is this, like... The United States really hasn't felt too much economic instability. I know that the like traditional news and media wants to really paint it as such, but the truth is, is we don't know what it's like to be Turkey. You know, we don't know what it's like to be Ecuador or to be Venezuela or these countries. And we think that we've like experienced some instability, but the truth is we really don't know. We've never gone to buy a loaf of bread and it's 5x the price from $5 to $30. And we just priced out of our food for the week in a single moment. And that's happening in Turkey. So I think once, like, and this is maybe like five to 10 years, you know, because you can only print for so long. We're $34 trillion in debt at this point. We've increased, you know, I, can't, I don't even know the multiple in such an extreme rate. And I think, um, like, uh, institutional and nationwide trust or distrust is going to increase as we go on because quantitative quantitative easing is not a new principle if you look at back at the romans they used to coin clip all the gold coins and then mint that <laughs> that extra gold into new coins and inflate the currency supply and it ended up being a huge problem within the roman empire and vice versa we're having the same thing here so inflation and trying to stretch currency is not a a, a new idea and it never works out in the long run and so i think what we're going to end up seeing is that uh, kids are going to slowly start distrusting the traditional monetary system and I, I know, to be honest, I'm 32, and that's already happening for me. I, I see my money in the bank, and I'm like, man, I, I kind of don't, I kind of don't trust it here. I don't know what happened along the way. It wasn't something definable; it was something undefinable. And I no longer felt like comfortable in this system. And so, no, I think that that's going to slowly start to increase, and we're going to start to see kids and nations as nations produce more instability, like Turkey. They're going to go to something like BTC that's nationless, because when you have single parties that make monetary decisions that can bring the downfall or bring the increase on a, a single instance you end up with like monopolization behind single choices which is almost always a risk for the people involved unless you're in a really altruistic nation which you know the united states has done a good job for a long time and i think elon musk like i don't want to monologue too much but i think he outlined this really well and he said after world war ii we had the opportunity to be a world power and we didn't we chilled out on it and he said a lot of nations would have taken that opportunity and just kind of ramrodded and so i do think there are some altruistic very cool things about the united states but I do think ultimately no nations lasted forever. I'm not trying to be doom and gloom. I love the United States. You know, I wear a flag proudly and I would, I love my nation. But um, I think ultimately we will see some instability economically. And as that increases, we'll definitely see adoption of Bitcoin and private wealth management is like $10 trillion and nobody, private wealth managers aren't really advising to put Bitcoin into like small wealth managers. So even if you have three to 5% at $10 trillion, that's fine. $500 billion. Free Texas, I think you might be hot micing just a little bit, just as an FYI. Um, so no, as you start to see private wealth managers start to move those monies from individual uh, citizens over, it's about a $10 trillion market. That's $500 billion out of 5%, which right now, you know, BTC is at like 1.5 1.5 T. So, you know, it's an increase of, of quite a bit just on private wealth management, not including all the additional ETFs because there's only a very select few of ETFs that can come in right now. So yeah, I, th I think we're still at the ground floor. And I think, you know, as those two things start to really shake, we're going to see some crazy adoption across the world. Those are some excellent thoughts. Gary or Chris, do you have any comments on that? No, I agree. Uh, I, I got a little lost on the where we were headed on the uh, the layers. I didn't quite understand if it was pro or positive, uh, positive or negative that oh. you know, people are building on I mean, think, no, I really like your comments. I think they're balanced. I mean, if people are going to build, there's going to be a lot of failures, and there'll be some successes. Uh, for me, I'll take the long money on Bitcoin because I think the return is going to be, I think the return is going to really underestimate. Um, I think it's being grossly underestimated by everyone that's been in this space for 10 years. 
I think everyone is underestimating this this opportunity because um, I, I just think the brain is the human brain is really difficult to understand how pervasive Bitcoin could be. Uh, and again, maybe I'm just drinking my Kool Aid, right? But I I continue not to be able to find reasons not to love it. Um, and that that's why I get so passionate about. It. I don't know why people would play around with disposable income on a lottery ticket when you just have this sure thing here. Um, anyway, I'll be quiet. We got some other people up, Sam. I'm going to let you run it because you run these shows better than I do, dude. Yeah, uh, Kelly, I was going to have you come and speak earlier. Did you have any comments, especially on what Wolf Web 3 was talking about or just any comments in general? Hey, yeah, welcome, uh, welcome everybody here and thank you for having me. Uh, go ahead and reshare the space. It's great alpha. Um, yeah, I got some, you know, I just, I get kind of enamored uh, by the exactly what Gary just said. I think it's so undervalued and it blows my mind and it just really reinforces how much of a bubble we live in. A great exemplification of that is that Ohio State commencement speech where, uh, speech where everybody booed. Some people feel like that was a bad thing. And, I, and I'm over here thinking about how, how damn bullish it is that the majority of the people out there are, are, are not yet here on the boat. Unfortunately for the majority, they're going to be so far behind the ball uh, with institutions now running in now, but that doesn't mean there's not still going to be opportunity for everybody that is here. Holy, holy, uh, holy moly. We are so far ahead of the curve. Now, what I do want to say is in terms of where we're at right now, uh, you know, the title of this one is accumulation to whale addresses. And it's one of the, one of the most undervalued tools in this space. I think is people's lack of just general awareness of on-chain data because for among the probably the first times in history it's like being an insider with and all you are is just a person that understands how to look at the transparent data that's available to you some people are worried by the small pullback that we've had yet it's still one of the smallest pulls you know smaller pullbacks in the context of greater market the the macro markets all the different previous bull cycles we've had and so everything that we're seeing right now to me just screams buy 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 right now because we are resetting all like many of the important signals that you would want to reset even if you don't know technical analysis on a deep level there's plenty of uh, people who follow wolf uh, Texas West Capital, Gary Cardone, uh, The Rational Root, there's uh, Dylan LeClaire, Will Clemente. There's so many people out there sharing data for free if you don't know where to find it. And right now we're seeing even on the weekly basis, we're seeing the stochastics fully reset, uh, which to me says, hey, we're, we're setting up for a move to come. We see the Puel multiple resetting much like it did last cycle right before the big move up and that's all, all obviously tied to the having that just occurred uh but we also see uh the uh, inactivity right now on, on the uh, active addresses right now uh dropping precipitously that's because the majority of the people in the market act emotionally and they don't look at the data they get focused on the price much like gary said a few minutes ago he felt eight thousand was high only now to see how high it's gone and that's i think still a huge problem with retail that are still broadly completely unaware of how Bitcoin is a different type of asset that encompasses every type of asset. And this price is an absolute steal where it's at right now. So I'm bullish as I can be. And I just want to really encourage people to zoom out, look at the macro, understand the market cycles, not only on the having cycle, but also the global liquidity cycle that's kind of paired up with the having cycle. And we are in for an incredible bull run still to come. That's my thoughts. That's awesome, Kelly. I uh, I saw that kid getting booed. I thought that was so funny. I would have probably yelled, nerd. <laughs> Just, I'm surprised there weren't more people shouting at that kid. I thought that was so funny. Um, yo, what is up, Free Texas News? What's going on? I know you've had your hand up for a while. What alpha do you got for us? Hey, what's happening? Sorry for the hot mic there. I'm getting the grill ready to cook some uh, KNC cattle beef initiative beef. As oh, usual. hell yeah. That seems, seems to be the, the theme when I come in these spaces. I'm out here grilling. So. That's Anyhow, we love um, I dropped a, uh, I don't know if it's a glitch on my end. The purple pill is not open to, to drop things in, so I dropped it up in the nest. And kind of talking about the innovation, you know, that's happening that Wolf was talking about a little bit. Um, I had a chance to volunteer at Bitcoin Plus Plus here in Austin uh, last week and into the weekend, and I couldn't spend as much time as I wanted there 
Um, but the thing I dropped in the... Free Texas, real quick, what is Bitcoin yeah. Plus Plus? Can you just tell the audience? Yeah, so it's a uh, conference that's put on by Nifty May. Um, she's a, a pretty well-known Bitcoin developer, works a lot on the Lightning Network. Um, and it's very technical, uh, very dev, kind of cutting edge um, conference that she holds. And she just did one in Argentina. I believe she's doing one in Europe coming up. And then there's a yearly one here in Austin. And um, it was a lot of the people that are into what Wolf was talking about with the scripts. And you know, some of the ordinal guys were there and people that are building these layer, uh, you know, two things um, on Bitcoin were there kind of hashing out their differences in person and, and presenting what they're working that's on the cutting edge, you know, stuff that's not live yet. A lot of stuff that we need, you know, soft works to enact. Um, and the thing I posted up in the nest is really interesting. It was a session that I had a chance to, to actually be at and pay a little more attention to, but basically a way that you can swap out signers for an address without doing an on-chain transaction and a very interesting way to do that. So I think there's a lot of interesting implications potentially for businesses um, with that technology if somebody was to use it. Um, but, you know, after the week we had with Samurai and kind of the, the feeling that we're stepping more into the then they fight you stage, it's really bullish to be there and to be around a lot of those super smart, positive guys that are guys and gals, frankly, that are, you know, building the future of Bitcoin. That's awesome, Free Texas. I appreciate that comment. I, I didn't even know about that developer conference. So I always encourage by hearing stuff like that happen because you kind of don't think about it. I'm always like, what are the devs doing? And so that's cool. Whoever that lady is, I'm glad she's taking the initiative to organize those conferences. Yeah, jump into the uh, that that uh, post in the nest, and it's you can see a hero gamer and then BTC plus plus, and give that account a follow. And then they're posting videos on there as they kind of get them chopped down. Um, and you can see what's happening on the cutting edge. Gotcha. Thank you for that. Wade, what's going on, man? You got your hand up. Nice to see you again. Glad you're up here. What's going on? What's up, Sam? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. I can hear you loud and clear. Hey, just housekeeping thing. Uh, second on Free Texas, the uh, purple pill's broken. Uh, so not sure what's up with that, but it's hard to uh, uh, repost the space. But you can share it. Uh, I did notice that that's working. Uh, second off, um, I had a question for Gary. With his extensive uh, experience in the nat gas uh, markets and whatnot, does he see something like moving forward similar to like a highly developed like Bitcoin mining futures market? And like, does he see it as something that like would get as complex as the environment that he was working in when he was active in in nat gas and petroleum? Dude, I, I think this is going to get so complex, it's going to be unbelievable. I mean, you're going to have derivatives. I already know two miners that their entire purpose is to sell against the volatility on the grid. They have no interest in the Bitcoin. So you will have people coming at this from very different angles. Um, I've had two opportunities to invest in them. I just don't. You know, for me, I just don't understand some of that well enough. I mean, I, you know, I'll tell you one thing. I, I get concerned about miners, and this is not poking or po pointing to anyone in particular, but miners, it sounds like you've got some energy experience. Uh, if Lou Pye or Jeff Skillings is out there, come on, pop up in here. I'll call you Casper the Ghost or something, and we can chat about this. I, I think... The um, an engineering company, a mining company that thinks it can safely play around with volatility and electricity. Uh, man, I've seen some really, really big companies go bust, you know, within like weeks um, when they got it wrong. So electricity and natural gas, especially electricity, has some tremendously different characteristics than Bitcoin. Um, no storage capability whatsoever. None. Okay. Opacity, like, okay, there's so much opacity. There's not, it's also not fungible. You can't just jump across grids easily. Very logistically problematic. 
uh, loads are, I mean, just to give you a sense of how complex you're talking about, you're se imagine selling call options in the summer during Wimbledon um, in London, and, and you forgot, you know, there's also a so soccer match in Brazil. Um, it takes about two and a half coal-fired power stations to turn on within seconds at, at uh, halftime because everybody goes to boil some, a cup of tea. Okay, so the, just, just imagine trying to manage that kind of load. Um, man, that gas is at $1.87. I started my career, it was seven, close to $7. It was $7.63, I think, um, or $7.36. And escalating forever in time. Today it's $1.87. Now, you know what they did? They let the market work. Go, go watch the whole Enron story. I just watched it again. It's a hilarious story. Uh, most of it quite accurate. Um, and the whole thing in California, you know, pe people did suffer out there in California. Okay. I think it was a little bit over dramatized. Uh, but that was due to California's lack of willingness to do any type of regulation that was free market. But in the United States, the United Kingdom and Europe, most of Europe, the energy markets today, natural gas and electricity, are the most accurate and efficient markets in the world, bar none. Okay, there's no force majeure anymore in, in Europe if you're selling uh, into the futures market, OTC or otherwise. There's no hurricane that blows over you. Like we created virtual trading points, uh, pools, if you will, and those pools have a price and that price is either met or the power shows up and these markets work really well my point is nuclear power stations went bankrupt utilities went bankrupt Enron went bankrupt the powers continued to flow it was simply a matter of who was holding the paper that controlled those kilowatts or the receivables from those kilowatts so if we leave the market alone this is why i think bitcoin is going to have such a remarkable opportunity because those markets work. It drove prices down and the United States who led that type of deregulation, true free market deregulation, we have the cheapest and most innovative energy complex the world has ever seen. Uh, I mean, okay, but all producers don't like 187, okay? They clearly overshot. But this is the problem with commodity producers. Once they know how to do something, it's either the price lets them drill more create more, innovate for more, or the low price forces them to get innovative, uh, which is why we have fracking today. When oil prices were down near 30 bucks, man, people, they don't stop drilling. You know, a surgeon's not going to stop doing surgery just because he's not being paid if there's a need. So these guys drill, drill, drill. Um, and they continue to find. That's why everything goes to zero, especially if you think about it in Bitcoin terms. So I, I think there's going to be a lot of uh, applications, man. I think that's a brilliant question. I would love to have an energy conversation space, but I don't want it to all be about mining. It gets so like, but I think there's a structural energy play here. And quite frankly, if the U.S. fossil fuel companies don't do it, the nuclear utilities will most certainly do it. So I would suggest the fossil fuel guys need to jump in front of their domestic competition, which is nukes. But the truth is the sovereign energy companies that are the most dominant energy companies today in the world, they will do it. They are doing it. So this is now simply about how the chessboard plays out and who, who does it the best and the fastest, in my opinion. Fossil fuel is going to be the, 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 the miner of the future. That, that would be my predict, which would really allow for these fossil fuel companies, multiples, to finally get out of the dark ages, okay? Because we are in the dark ages without fossil fuel, folks, okay? We are in the dark ages. And so why does an ExxonMobil get such a low, such a low multiple relative to some of these super tech companies? And those super tech companies are reliant on that very fossil fuel. So I'll end with that. Hey, Gary, I saw that you posted a, a crazy visual chart. I've never seen anything like it before. 
uh, it was the 200 uh, week moving average chart of Bitcoin, and it was like a hockey stick. I was wondering if you and Chris could comment on like on that, and if anyone had ever seen a chart like that in their professional careers, or or if anyone had ever done a chart overlay with that and like gold or or some other comparable asset. Uh, that, that we're seeing like Bitcoin to project to, to grow at. Yeah, no, I've, I've never seen, <laughs> that was my big thing uh, when I came into Bitcoin was, uh, and I talked about it a lot back in the day was that, um, you know, to me, this is a, you know, like a once in a generation type play here. This is, you know, I've been doing this almost 30 years uh, never seen anything close to this, uh, to what Bitcoin's just done over the last, you know, almost 15 years now. Uh, absolutely insane. Um, it just, yeah, no, I, I think, it, I don't think, I don't think we're going to see things like this. You know, it, uh, they just, it just doesn't happen, uh, like this usually. This is a once in a century event, man. Like a once in a century, this this won't happen again. This volume, right? It's just gonna. It's um, it's seriously a very large pivot from analog to digital. That's simply the best way to look at it. At some point, we will go into like you remember the whole CV nineteen thing, the whole thing about herd mentality. Hey, when does the 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 switch just flip because you basically have critical mass. That happens on one variable user, right? That next user, just like the prices, how price will establish uh, the Bitcoin market. And I, I, that's what I love about you, Chris. You believe the market works. And at a price, I know Joe's here too, the price will define the sellers in the market. And there's clearly been whales been selling this market right here. I don't blame them. You know, I, I mean, if I have a three hundred dollar purchase price, I might slim down and buy a piece of, you know, three three million acres of land somewhere, um, and I, I still got a ton of money left over. So, um, love the conversation. Love the conversation, Gary. Also, you you had brought it up before, and I thought it was brilliant that the Bitcoin was almost criminally underpriced uh, years ago, which is why we've had so many millions of bitcoin uh, likely lost and you also well, I, I didn't say criminally I, I see this to me is a very so, sorry for interrupting but i think this is a very good um uh if i was a lawyer how would i say this that that, that uh, an indicator characteristic that one bitcoin was grossly mispriced uh, maybe low maybe high okay but when you lose three million of anything Dude, you do not respect it. And I think respect comes with price. You know, I respect a woman that wants me to open her door and, or, or a client that, you know, charges me a little bit more because he's better, right? Like I would expect Joe, if I'm doing work with Joe and his firm on the digital side, I don't need him to be Mr. Discounter. Okay, I need him to be good or great, better, better yet. And, and so that's what I was saying about the, I don't think Bitcoin's priced correctly. Well, until you have the analysts going through the 13 to 15 attributes of Bitcoin and then being able to subdivide each one of those attributes, like for me, I believe the community impact and effect, the very point that I have met you and Joe and others through this gravity, this force of gravity that's called Bitcoin, uh, I'd like to know what value is associated at $63,000 with this community effect. And this community effect pulled me out of a freaking cave and, and, and got me in touch with a lot of cool people that I would not have gotten in touch with on any other subject matter, including religion, by the way. And, and it's more expansive and, and uh, leads to more open doors than any other kind of congregation. So... What price is the Goldman Sachs 22-year-old analyst going to place on the community value of Bitcoin? When we have that, dude, then we've established the real value of Bitcoin. Until then, we are so stupidly underpriced, in my opinion. Um, 
just just that conversation on community. What would you guys pay for? It, would anybody pay a dollar a year if you're holding a coin a dollar a year to be a part of the Bitcoin Association? Shit, I would. Okay, I'd pay some little piece of all the ETFs trading for the community effect. Gary, I just put the chart up in the nest. So what is the chart that we're looking at? Can you tell me about it? It's the 200-week moving average? Yes. I think Gary reposted it last week. Gotcha. Gary, where'd you go? I just put the chart up for you. Yeah, yeah. So, so what does that say? I can't read it. Um, so it says wild chart. I think, is this the Berkshire Hathaway? This is the, it's whatever you just sent me. <laughs> I know yeah, it's hard yeah, to read. Well, that, that, that's the Berkshire Hathaway story. Ah, okay, that's, okay. See, back here in 1995, okay, it was roughly around $8,000, okay? The most expensive it had ever been. I mean, stupid, okay? People are like, oh! <gasps> Who is this guy wooing eight thousand dollars a share? Why does he do the quadruple split? Right, he would never split. He's like, it's stupid to split, right? So uh, this stock went to six hundred and eleven thousand dollars. Is today's print? That's a seventy six x. Okay, in my lifetime, man, my in my adult investment age bracket from twenty two, twenty five years old to here. Okay, and I am speaking specifically to the 18 and the 30 year olds here, man. Okay, I could have put eight grand to work and it would be worth $611,000 today. That's staggering. Okay, so why do I believe Bitcoin cannot do something like this? And I have other, sh other graphs like this, right? When you, when you come pull out 25 years, dude, go look at NVIDIA. Thing looks very similar to this. And guess what else looks like this, but early? Bitcoin. So this is a beautiful chart. The chart the gentleman's talking about is just a, basically they remove, they go on a log scale and they remove every little price movement. They only show you what happened over every 200 days. And the thing looks like um, it's a Russian freaking hypersonic missile. Does that help? It helps me a lot. I mean, it's just crazy even thinking. I mean, of course, I wasn't born yet, but just thinking about Berkshire Hathaway as well, and just kind of yeah. Look at that. Look at that price, dude. That that that's a seventy six Xer. Okay, Let, let's look at say Bitcoin. Okay, sh let's go. You couldn't have bought Bitcoin in ninety five. Okay. Um, I, I would look at Bitcoin and go, okay, well, let's use $40,000. $40,000 is my average price. Do I think that could do a 76X? Why not? This guy did it, holding 42% of his interest today is held in Apple. The other is a monster pipeline in railway. I mean, you can see what he's interested in business, right? Technology and logistics. And it'll keep going up. I, I, I mean... This is a great, you know, he, he knows how to, and he's got a monster amount of money on his balance sheet. Waiting to put it to work, I assume. But he'll never do oh, that. He would, do, oh, that don't, don't do these people, he, he'll he wake up one morning and be very happy to be wrong and and apologize. He Like, they're in it for the money, dude. They, they, if they're... These guys, when they get their head in the sand, it's because they're so rich, they don't have to look at it anymore. They're checked out, maybe, right? Yeah. Uh, we don't need all of them to get it. Sequoia gets it, dude. $1.3 billion. Hey, Joe, how's that news, dude? We're going to see this all summer, guys. It's going to get irritating. Oh, this guy did $3 billion. This shit sheet did this thing. Turkey puts some shit on his balance sheet. I, I have a feeling Turkey, I've been saying this for a year, because where they are politically... They just piggy in the freaking middle, man. I think if I'm him, I start sneaking some Bitcoin on my balance sheet. Joe, what's up, buddy? Hey, Gary. How are you doing? Awesome, man. Yeah, you know, I, I want to just go back to a comment made earlier, which I think somebody that was in, I think maybe it was Wolf was talking about, you know, 
uh, individuals or, you know, in, in, people waking up and deciding to get small exposure for Bitcoin. And I kind of want to marry that to what you just said, which was, I, I really believe that the path forward for, for Bitcoin is primarily going to be driven by bigger players. I, I really think that retail is just never going to get it. Uh, I know there's this video making the rounds of people laughing at folks on, uh, what was it, the Ohio State commencement. Um, you know, and to your point, right, just there's a reason why dumb retail is dumb retail, right? It's just that people just will not wake up to this thing, um, especially at the, the lower levels, um, you know, lower income tiers. It's really sad. I really wish people of modest means had, would have more investable assets generally and save and be more frugal. But, um, you know, there's there's reason why the wealthy are wealthy. It's because of decisions that they make in a lot of respects uh, versus uh, the working class and you know it's a mindset more than anything else and it, and it matters in the long run to, to make those good choices so like to me like when i hear these things about bigger players getting exposure to bitcoin i think that is 100 percent the path forward i think you're you're not you, the, the days of the the mom and pops buying whole bitcoins uh, i think those are long gone and really it, it's not for, for purposes of price appreciation it's not necessary to get the you know the the guys that have very modest means because they're just not going to propel the price to a million dollars of Bitcoin if we ever got there or you, even to a hundred thousand dollar Bitcoin. You just need you know one or two more Michael Saylors to get to a hundred k Bitcoin. Um, so anyway, just my thoughts. Joe, we need you to win that poker tournament. I'm in a hole, so you can yeah. just you know you can whale it up, bro. Yeah, but but I mean the example earlier I think it was Wolf that brought up is like. Turkey, okay, and, and other other countries that are experiencing hyperinflation. Well, you know what they want in those countries? They want the dollar. I mean, they're, they're not buying Bitcoin. They're not buying gold, right? Those folks want the relative stability of the dollar so they can, you know, not have to worry about groceries costing 15% more, you know, every month. They're just, they're desperate for dollars. And to me, that, that just shows you the path this is going forward. I think that, you know, consuming people, people that don't have a ton of excess savings, they're going to be using relative sources of stable mediums of exchange like, um, you know, like the dollar. And you're going to have the wealthy, people with means, people like you, Gary, and others saving in Bitcoin and other assets. And and that, you know, my, my friend Bitcoin Team is in, in, the, uh, uh, in the audience and he says, he said yesterday, and I'll steal it from him with attribution, you know, the rich have solved inflation for many years. The way the rich deal with inflation, uh, they buy assets, period. Full stop. They buy assets and then they control it and protect themselves from inflation. I love that point, Joe, because I think a lot of people, they see other countries in turmoil and they go, oh, that country's going to be into Bitcoin. And I think that's a great point. Actually, I think a lot of them are just going to be wanting dollars. Right. And I was like, that's I think that's a really interesting point. It's always fascinating to me that is high as we think inflation is here that people are still longing for the dollar as a, as a mean of exchange is just a currency because it's more stable than what they got. Which, by the way, Gary, I DM Joe because I want to do a space with him on um, maybe some regulatory stuff because I just love his regulatory opinion. So maybe in a week or two, me and him are going to do a space and we'll focus on that, which I think will be a whole lot of fun. I'm his appointment manager. I make all the booking fees. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> just d deal with me in my office and we'll handle it. That's right. We'll go through you. We'll go through you. Absolutely. Uh, Joshua, Joshua Pardue, how you doing, man? What's going on? What alpha do you got for us? Josh, are you there? Oh, I guess he's not. Uh, I guess he's speaking, but he's he's only listening. David Hill, what's going on, David? Good to see you again. Always good to see you on these faces. What you got for us? Hey, hey guys, happy to be here. What's up? What's up, Sam? How you doing, man? Good to see you. Good. What do you got to say? You got any comments on what we've been talking about? Uh, man, I popped in probably about seven minutes ago. Uh, but I always love being in on the conversations with you guys. And I would just say this to Gary, something funny happened the other day. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm very involved with my chambers and I've been talking about Bitcoin, uh, you know, for months. And there was a lady that came up to me because, you know, I always say Gary's the one who got me into Bitcoin. And there was a lady that come up to me. She works at a local bank and she said that I was the one that got her uh, buying Bitcoin. So I just thought that was super cool 
how uh, how it just you know it just flows around, right? So I came in, started listening to you guys, listening to Gary, got some Bitcoin. I go out, I start talking about it, and now a uh, a lady at the bank who really the first time I mentioned it thought I was crazy, and then started looking at it, and now she's telling me she's got some Bitcoin. So I thought that was super cool. That is awesome, dude. Good job, great job. One person at a time. That's all it takes is just one person at a time. Samuel, I was going to ask. I don't. Oh yeah, I was going to ask if I could kind of. Um, Joe made a point, but um, not necessarily a counterpoint, but but something I think that is at least important to the oh, conversation. Go ahead, dude. I, we like counterpoints. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. I can't I mean, wolf, so I'm going to go down. Agree with everything. It's going to be really boring echo chamber. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 I, I okay. Jump so jump down because I can't hear Wolf. Hang on. Yeah, so I, I think some of my, my key points, if you read the white paper, like BTC is originally a peer-to-peer -peer transfer. Like the point of it is supposed to be nationless and borderless, like originally because of a, a growing distrust in like centralized monetary policy. And I'm not saying that that's the use case that brings it into, you know, a $10 trillion asset or a $20 trillion asset. Obviously, those use cases are, are slightly different now with ETF inflows because now you're getting like institutional adoption, but they're not thinking of it as a peer-to-peer -peer transfer. I mean, they're completely custodial. ETFs literally have all of their BTC hey, controlled and held by just, a different just, can I, Yeah. Can I just interrupt one second? Yeah. So, please. Before you go, because you said, hey, originally the white paper... And then you use the word originally again. Um, if I'm in the audience, what I hear from that is that the original and initial use per Satoshi was peer to peer. And I will debate with you that I don't read that in the white paper. I read that this was his vision for peer to peer, but he did not say it would happen at the first stage of adoption. I don't see that as a part of the white paper that says the adoption has to happen peer to peer initially. Uh, or that it would even happen initially. Do you do you read that? Have I misread this somewhere? Well, I mean, yeah. So there's like a couple factors to it. So as far as the white paper, I don't remember like timelines or anything like that. So I can't speak on that. But there's like a couple like key things. One, the epoch rewards are decreasing, so that transaction fees is going to have to increase to hold up the miners, or else the electric pricing or the electric costs for miners needs to decrease drastically so this is the last epoch where miners are going to be able to really be supported off rewards alone if we don't see a severe decrease in electric pricing so transaction yeah, like throughput. Could, what if you sell energy prices at, at, at no cost whatsoever in what sense what like well, well there's no need for there is an absolutely no need for a sovereign to charge themselves a unit mm, for fossil fuel, hang tight, the other audience might not, it, it, the sovereign doesn't have to charge himself $3 for gas if it's sitting in the ground doing nothing. He will simply take that, freaking turn it into Bitcoin, and stick it on his balance sheet. And, and the only people that aren't going to do that is a public oil company that has to go get you know a bunch of approvals and scratch their ass and think about it. But, a, you know, if you're Iraq, bro, you're already doing this. You don't need to make a margin. Nobody made any money on Bitcoin unless they stole electricity, producing it at 300, 800, 8,000 bucks. Very few people made money doing that. Right? Do you agree with that? Yeah. Yeah, 100%. It's yeah. sad. I'm bearish on that point, like overall, just because I. It's just yeah, a fact the market, so. No, I know. Oh, definitely. This is the way markets work. That, yeah. that may not be bad, dude. I mean, no. why wouldn't you want our country to have the best engineering in the world to build these data centers? This is going to be a monster game. To go peer-to-peer -peer the way you originally heard that story, okay, where we end up, you must have mega, mega data centers, mega energy, okay? And you can't have it flipping on and flipping off. The day of the, the miner sitting in his house, unless he's stealing money from his dad, uh, electricity from his dad, dude, that's over. Yeah. I know. Cause, I, I'm sad to say it. You know, I'm not the enemy here, but. No, no, I, I understand what you're saying. Because if energy doesn't decrease, that means that there's no reward or reason for, like, 
<laughs> for residential or retail to participate in the equation because the problem is, is they're priced out unless the transaction goes up. This is kind of like why I think layer two kind of in some ways fixes the issue because now what we're seeing with ordinals and runes is like a mass hysteria to get their transactions through and they're increasing transaction fees. This won't happen across the board, but this is the first wave of iteration or innovation on top of the BTC chain. And so you're seeing, you know, miners get like heavy rewards due to people building kind of, in, I wouldn't say inappropriate, but an unplanned way. I know that BitVM was still planned by Satoshi a long time ago. He had the idea that people would kind of tap into the proof of work system and use that compute to build on top of it, but, but maybe not in this specific way. So I guess my thought was originally is that we would see kind of a, a freedom land because we would get some iteration and some innovation on top of the chain, increasing transactions so that retail could stay in the game. But I really hadn't thought about the idea that retail gets pushed out. And now we see only institutions that are betting on like heavy price action and, and future volatility to be able to, you know, hand, like handhold their way through losing on the on the electric prices and then nations coming in and, and holding it. It's kind of a bummer because to you, be you honest, don't need, you don't even need to, go, need to go that far though. Well, I mean, look, look at just a simple math. If Bitcoin gets to be a two trillion dollar asset and the annual security budget, he, he broke up on me there. Well, can you hear me, Gary? I can hear you, Joe. Jerry, Gary, okay. can you hear Joe? Negative. Oh, man. Joe, say something. Can you hear me, Somebody Gary? Somebody else was Gary? speaking, and they just broke off. Gary? Um, I thought it was Wolf. Hang on. Let me jump down. I'll come right back up. Sorry, Joe. <laughs> That's like the, the second time that happened. Wolf, uh, Wolf, can you use your Elon contacts to get him to figure out spaces? <laughs> Gary, <laughs> yeah, what Gary can, can you hear me now? Gary? Yes, we can hear, I can hear you, Joe. Uh, Gary, can you hear Joe? Gary? <laughs> Bueller. <laughs> Sometimes, Gary. Joe, if you'll, if you'll go out and you'll switch yes, the listener yes, first. I, oh, I, you can. Okay. I can hear you guys. Okay. I was just saying, here's the basic math, okay? And, and, and if you're talking about, about fees and the decreasing block reward, Lynn Alden has a whole article, I think it's like 10,000 words on the security budget, and the numbers you get are this. If you got Bitcoin to a two or three trillion dollar market cap, which is not significantly higher than it currently is, and you assess the, the between the block reward and fees, or actually if you throw out the block reward entirely, you just use fees, and you get to one percent of the market cap annualized fees for demand from block space, uh, just just from individuals, not even retail, just individuals on chain, in that environment, one percent of you know two trillion dollars. Okay, you're talking one point, you know, one point five, one point, you know, somewhere other than margins. You're talking like twenty to thirty billion dollars in an annual security budget. That's more than enough to secure the hardware and electricity and everything else required to sustain solid security for the Bitcoin network. So, you know, she breaks down the math in much more detail. Now, that's that's like a two or three trillion dollar, you know, market cap. I know many people who think, you know, Bitcoin eventually gets to ten or fifteen or twenty trillion. Um, at that point, you know, even 1% of the market cap annualized in fees, you, you're talking a massive security budget of hundreds of billions of dollars of security annually for the network. Yeah, I think something I'd add in there if I could jump in real quick and I just posted it up in the nest. It was a great talk from Bob Burnett, um, who was the former CTO of Gateway. Computer. I think you and I are in total, uh, total agreement, right, Joe? Yeah, Gary, you, you have a problem. Uh, Free Texas was talking as well. I think you can't hear him. Okay. Yeah, I'll be real quick. I just put it up in the, the nest. Uh, 30 minutes worth everybody's time and wants to think about this. And I agree with you, Wolf. I think the intention of the, the white paper was did, did explicitly say peer-to-peer, -peer, but also I believe it was later talked about in the forums how that, you know, it also wouldn't scale. And that's what Bob Burnett breaks down in that talk that I posted up in the nest. Uh, when he spoke at Bitblock Boom uh, in 2023, really opened my eyes. You know, I think, um, and to Joe's point and what Lynn broke down, that the security budget will be enough, but I think we'll just see it'll mostly be institutions moving, you know, uh, transactions around for settlement. It'll be very rare for individuals to control UTXOs, at least on their own. I'll, I'll, I'll pass off to the hands in a second, but I'll just say I never understood this 
you know, fidelity to the, the white paper. I mean, it's a white paper, guys. Like, projects evolve and expand and uh, change from their original purpose. Um, and, and obviously, as long as the core uh, ethos and core design is there, that's what's, what's important. But, you know, there's nothing in the white paper about 21 million. Not a single thing. Yeah, that's uh, that's some aggressive language, Joe. You better be careful what rooms you're in if you're with some some of the Maxis. They they'd hate that. It, it, but you're you're correct in the sense that um, there is there becomes this uh, certain cult following around what Bitcoin's supposed to do as opposed to what it is doing. Uh, and I think the ordinals and some of the other conversations that we're seeing are proof of that. And it's very fascinating to watch uh, just from a cultural perspective because I just I always find that kind of stuff really interesting. Um, Joshua, you've had your hand up for a while. What do you got to say, man? What's going on? Hey, uh, Josh is on a meeting right now, but he did want to send his, uh, regards. Literally, I've been trying to get him, flag him for the last 20 minutes, but he wanted to say his regards. Hello to everybody. The conversation around markets and potentially even like, um, investments is a conversation we're having frequently. And what it really what it comes down to, just from like a third person perspective, is are you guys going to take action and create active investment groups or conversations around protected invested interests with working with local development on energy core centers or locations within certain states that do protect this infrastructure uh, and remain at least focused on creating a mimic or style to the blockchain technology at least the underlying idea and those ideas are going to just be inf informative and inf and very beneficial to the security and understanding of the way we do business and transaction and at the core that's more important than mimicking the style but uh i just want to let you guys know that samuel thank you Gary, Christopher, three techs, you guys are wise beyond your time. Yeah, thanks for coming up, man. Thanks for coming up to speak. Wade, you got your hand up. What's going on? What do you got to say? What you got to comment I, on? Yeah, I just had a quick uh, quick question, comment for, for Joe's point on the flock flocking to the U.S. dollar. Um, been through uh, been through Gulf States, uh, CENTCOM territory uh, in my career, and with the recent United States uh, sanctions packages, uh, and the fact that uh, a lot of the OPEC uh, countries and the Gulf states are now transacting in uh, petroleum and all different types of foreign currencies instead of the United States dollar, well, and including the United States dollar, that looks like a diversification to me away from the United States dollar, uh, not a flock to the United States dollar for stability. I, I think there's some inherent instability there with the political machinations of the Treasury, State Department, Commerce, whatnot, especially with kind of the uh, sometimes capricious sanctions that we put out uh, across the planet, and and with the, especially the Gulf states, with them diversifying into trading in foreign currencies instead of a strict petrodollar, uh, with their gold acquisitions that they have, doesn't it make sense for a lot of Gulf sheiks to stack one to five percent of their portfolios in in, in Bitcoin? Uh, especially, I see them. Uh, diversifying away from the U.S. dollar, not not flocking to it. I was just wondering if folks could comment on that. Maybe Joe and Gary. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's refuted by the data. Um, so if what we know about public sources of the Saudi wealth fund, more, majority of it's held in American assets. And that's American assets are proxies for the American dollar, right? That's one of the reasons our stock market is so much the rival of the world. They buy stocks because they are keeping pace with the dollar and a relative purchasing power. And when, when you do business, right, you have to have a unit of account for those contracts. You have, and, and the Saudis are no different. Uh, most of OPEC nations are no different. They write contracts and what do they use as their unit of account? They use the dollar. Even if the transactions are settled in the dollar, it doesn't really matter how it's actually settled. What matters is what is their baseline. And the dollar, despite 
QE1, QE2, QE3, QE4, all the government spending, trillions of dollars, all the PPP loans, all of the bailouts, everything. The dollar is higher than it was today on a relative FX basis, first the yen and the euro, than it was 10 years ago. Why is that? Why in an over-indebted world do we continue to see people have a strengthening dollar? Dollars at 105, right? If you were to talk five years ago, tell people that it was at 105, they would say that's a, that's a high rate of exchange it's a prohibitive rate of exchange for many trade for international trade um so you see a strengthening and continued flocking to the dollar based on other peers right and, and again it doesn't matter what the settlement mechanism is because many times uh, it's not actually settled it's not like you're bringing gold to somebody you're bringing barrels of money all it is is a ledger entry on uh, you know a deposit that basically gets erased or reduced based on you know whatever trade is being commenced so to me i think this is this we hear this narrative every single year the decline of the dollar i remember being in the early 90s uh in school like grade school hearing about the decline of the u.s dollar right Dollar does more international transactions and is denominated more frequently for international trade than it was 30 years ago. It is it has continued to uh, gain market share. So, uh, you know, I think if you look into the subject very deeply, you'll find, as I did, that the the, the rumors of the demise of the dollar have long been exaggerated. So you see the Gulf states and the Arab states uh, and even the OPEC states is just, hey, we're, we're hitching, we're hitching our, uh, you know, our trailer to the, to the United States foreign policy regardless. We're, like, we're not going to get no, sanctioned. I, don't think, I think they're totally independent because the U.S. doesn't control the dollar. The U.S. has never controlled the dollar. That's, you can Google and look up the euro dollar system. Um, regardless of what the, do, what the U.S. does from a monetary fiscal standpoint, um, aside from the fact that they have access to, you know, the Federal Reserve's ability to, you know, buy assets, the the you, the international dollar based system is completely independent of the U.S. system. And when you are deciding what to denominate debt in, right now, okay, if you're doing if you're a business actor, just think of it like you're an economic actor, right? And you want to you want to draw up a contract. Are you going to draw that contract up in gold? Right? What businessman would do that when gold can go up 10% in the next you know, two months, potentially? That's bad for whoever's on the losing side of that in the domination. Are you going to draw it up in Bitcoin? Are you going to draw a contract up in Bitcoin when Bitcoin could be over $100,000 and somebody's going to have to you know, pay 30 40% more in their obligation in that contract? Are you going to draw it up in the Russian ruble? Are you going to draw it up in the Chinese yuan who continually debase their currency? Give me the currency other than the dollar you're going to actually draw up the commercial trade in. And I will, I mean, I'd be shocked if you find one that is more stable and reliable than the U.S. dollar. Joe, how read up on the euro dollar system are you? I love. Extremely. I read about it all the time. Like it's my, you it's read, my uh, you read Jeffrey yeah. Schneider and you watch yeah, his stuff I, I, at Dollar University? Yeah. I love Jeffrey Snyder. I think he's awesome. He's quirky. He's terrible for investment advice. I would never follow him for anything related to navigating like your own finances. But his deep knowledge of the euro dollar system, I think, is pretty much unmatched. I'd love to have a space with you on that because that's something that I've always, every time I think I understand it, I just read something and then I almost feel like I'm starting from square one. Um, so if you're well-read and you know some other well-read people, I find the euro dollar system, for some reason, even though it's kind of gaining in popularity, is the one thing that I don't think enough people in this space understand, especially Bitcoin people, when they're talking about the decline of the U.S. dollar. I don't think any of them really understand the euro dollar system and why it's so entrenched in how it works. I'd love to do a space on that with a uh, with a group of people who really get it. So yeah, there's plenty. Of your I mind. can give you some names of people that are even more knowledgeable than me on this. But suffice it to say, if you're trying to grasp this at home, like just and you haven't even heard about it, and you might wait a second. I thought the dollar is controlled by the Fed and the Treasury. The most important thing to remember is that international banking institutions can literally create dollars out of thin air right now without even holding the dollars. Right. There is a bank. Well, I don't want to get into that because it's going to be a total digression. But there are banking institutions. <laughs> there, there, there are banking institutions that can literally extend lines of credit to individuals without dollars behind them. They have, they may have treasuries as part of their reserves, but they can all of a sudden a few clicks of, on their magic keyboard, and now you've got thirty billion dollars in your account. 
$30 billion USD. And obviously you can't withdraw all that. It's going to be very difficult, but you have that credit that is, is there in the form of, you know, a bank, uh, bank creation for you. So, you know, this, these are things you got to get to understand because at its core, money is a ledger system and Bitcoiners know that they understand like what a ledger system is, but you got to remember banks control the ledger. Banks can create entries on the ledger ledger. They could theoretically expand the money supply infinitely. And I'm not talking about central banks, I'm talking about commercial banks, private economic actors. It's so insane. Our, our system is so insane. Um, and when you just factor in all the other economic principles and then like just the sentence foreign banks can theoretically create dollars by extending credit. Like, like what is this world? It's uh, how many people know that? How many people understand that? Right. It throws the basis of what a lot of us, I think, foundationally believe around the dollar just out the window. Um, Gary, I know we're coming up on 730. I want to make sure everyone's had a chance to talk who's up on this stage. So, um, Gary, what are you thinking? Are you still with us, Gary? I see uh, Bitcoin Tina requesting to speak. Although, Bitcoin Tina, I'm going to let you up here, but I don't know how much longer we're going to be here. Let me add you as a speaker. Now, Bitcoin Tina, I remember meeting Bitcoin Tina. Jeez. Um, met Bitcoin Tina, funny enough, and I don't even know if you remember this. At a conference, maybe six or seven years ago, I don't know Bitcoin if it was 20, North Bitcoin 2019 in a hotel in San Francisco. Yes, I remember. That's right. That's right. In San, you're right, San Francisco. I remember. You're right. That was only 2019. I thought it was longer ago. Nope, 2019, Samuel. Well, it feels like an eternity. What's going on, Bitcoin Tina? It's not just. It's not just European banks. It, it's actually why most of what Bitcoiners think about. Uh, the way the system works is completely wrong, and it's not—it's not actually crazy. I didn't—I didn't say it was just European banks. Just for the record, I didn't say it was right, just, European just European banks. But here's—but here's the thing that I have to come to terms with. Number one, credit will never go away. It's never going to go away, and I'll explain why. Because there is a symbiotic relationship between a businessman who wants a loan or a businesswoman who wants a loan and a bank who will make a loan. And that's how money is created. The payment system in the world, bank deposits, that is the money. This whole notion of fiat is just kind of stupid. People say fiat, fiat, fiat. It's, it's like, it's, it's, it's almost like just stupid autists not understanding what they're talking about. You satisfy obligations by transferring money from a commercial bank deposit to make a debt obligation payment or some other obligation payment that you have. At some point, it goes back to that. The only way deposits are created is when a loan is made. 